Good, but it's good, it's good to be here this morning with you guys. I know some of the guys, some people are at uh, Breakforth this morning. I was at Breakforth on Friday afternoon, just in the booth area, you know, where all the different, well, a lot of schools. If you're looking for a Christian school, that was the place to go. Um, a lot of uh, good information. And if you want to go this afternoon, visit the Canadian Southern Baptist Seminary uh, booth and just let the guy know that you, uh, that you know he exists. Because it's... Uh, uh, a lonely place, I think, for part of the day because when people are in sessions and stuff. But if you get a chance to go down, go ahead and, and uh, you'll find some interesting stuff down there. Well, free, uh, let, let's get started this morning in our message. And the title of the message is simply First Aid. Who is, who's First Aid qualified here? Louise is, and Daniel. And, 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 so there's a few people that are actually First Aid qualified. So if you're in trouble this morning, you're over, you know, if you start having a heart attack or whatever, we're okay, right? Because you guys should be able to take care of us. Give you a couple of aspirins and something to send you to the doctor. But uh, first aid, I just, a couple weeks ago, I took, with the name reserve, I took my first aid requalification. And every time I take first aid, it changes, right? But the good thing about first aid is that it teaches you to sort of recognize symptoms of people so that, so that you can maybe give them a hand or to help them out if they're, if they're struggling or if they're sick or, or if you notice something's wrong so that you might, make, might be able to know what to do to help them out. Um, you know, when I, I well, it was actually in my last semester at Old Oklahoma Baptist when I was at university that I, I took first aid. It was, it was a great, a great uh, semester. I only need like three hours left to my, finish off my degree. And so to be down in Oklahoma and to get my, get a student loan so I could finish off, I, I took, go ahead, went ahead and took uh, 12 hours of classes. And to do that, I meant that I took uh, my required class. And then I took uh, racquetball as a class, which is a fantastic class. I took first aid and CPR for a whole semester. It was, it, was, it was the best semester ever. I was on the president's honor roll, right? So uh, I had a 4-0 for that semester. One of the few semesters I actually had a 4-0. I didn't get a 4-0 another, another semester as well. It was in the short summer term. And I was when I say, took biology and, and another class and uh, actually got a 4-0 for that semester too. So that was, it was a rare thing. So it was kind of a, a great thing. I don't usually tell people that. I got on the president's honor roll, and it was when I took um, back racquetball first aid and then the Old Testament class. But it was all good. Um, anyways, but it, you know, it's, first aid is a handy thing to have. When you go to the doctor, though, first question that they ask is, what, ask is what's the problem, right? They ask how you're feeling. They ask you what your symptoms are, what your problem is, that you're feel, how, how you're feeling. If you go on to the internet, you can type in your symptoms and find out all kinds of things and you may, uh, that may uh, be right or may, or may be wrong, but if you believe most of what you find on the internet, you may have only a month or, or less to live, right? Because if you look at all, if you look, type in all your symptoms, they, they, it's, a, it's not a very good outlook, actually, typically. But, um, so, you know, symptoms and, and, uh, are a very important part of what we're doing. In my attempt, in the last little while, to try to understand what's wrong in our society, what's wrong with my generation, your generation, you know, what's wrong with people today. I've tried to look at the symptoms and assess what's, what is wrong. But, you know, the problem is I'm not a doctor, I'm not a sociologist or, or psychologist or any of those kinds of things. I'm just an average guy, an, an average pastor, and it's, I don't know all the answers how to fix it. And in some ways, if you look at it and look at all the different symptoms of our society, you might even come up and say, I don't know if, if it can be fixed. You know, there's, there's lots of problems up there right now today. So can it be fixed? Is it, is it looking possible? Does it look, look scary? Well, in some ways it is, but we can find a diagnosis, I think, in order to treat what ails the world we live in. And it's possible that... that we're not terminal. You know, it's not bleak, it's not gray the situation, and something can be done. But even if we get the symptoms and the diagnosis, who do we have to treat the patients? And do we have the medicine that is needed? I believe we have the answers to the questions we're asking today, and the answer is that we have a physician who we find in God's Word who can make a difference. So, in other words, what we're doing today is we're going to take this imaginary visit to the great physician today. The great, the, the doctor uh, in scripture that we're talking about is often referred to as Jesus Christ. You remember when he was upon the cross, 
the, the Pharisees actually mocked, mocked him and said, if, 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 if great hey, physician, if, you, if you're so great, heal yourself. Take yourself down from this cross. So they recognized that he could do amazing things. He could, he could change the world, really. So let's look at the first thing that we need to consider then is the symptoms. Now, this morning, I don't usually do this when, we, when I preach, but I'm going to let you guys do this. We're going to do this this morning. And what I want to do is, I want to ask you, what do you think the, the issues are the world is facing today? What are the symptoms of our problems today? Just one word answer. Let's see what you can come up with. Louise. Drugs. Drugs, yeah. What's another symptom today? Pride. Pride? Okay. What are some other symptoms of problems that you see today? I'm making you work. I'm not going to let you off the hook today. <laughs> Indigestion. Indigestion. You know what, Bill? <laughs> that's not that far off, off base. And as, as funny as that sounds, there's a very good reason a lot of people have problems with their stomachs and stuff. That is a symptom of problems in this world today. Because what are often the problems of, why do we have problems under problems? Besides, Overeating um, is that we have uh, stress. Who has who has been stressed out here because of exams in the last little while or your classes? Anybody? Oh, Peter, this is on this, and oh, Sonia is, is, is sort of halfway on this. Just hide your hand a little bit. I know that some of you guys have been stressed out about your classes. I know that even the high school students have been stressed out about their classes. And I know that some high school students probably were pretty stressed out when they found out somebody had cheated on the math the departmental this last week, and that they were talking about the possibility of, of um, people actually having to retake the math department. But Dan, would you have been happy if you had taken the math department over again? Would you have been happy if you had taken the departmental over again for math? No. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't have been great. So what are some other symptoms? Well, I would say loneliness. Anybody been lonely? How about inferiority? How, does anyone ever make you feel like you're, you lack? How about being out of place or unloved or rejected? You know, I, I put these things down here because there's, these are things that I've felt, I know that I've felt in, in lots of times. I've been, I've been in places when you can be in the biggest crowd and the largest, a room full of people and feel absolutely alone. I've been in a room where I feel like like the, the, you know that there's guys in there that are doctors, that they have their PhDs, or they have their, uh, you know, they're, they're so, they seem to be so intelligent, so smart, and yet I feel like I'm, I don't know anything. And I, you know, I did pretty good in my education wise, and, and uh, I even found out since I applied for my doctorate, I had a 3.6 grade point average in my master's, which I thought I, I didn't really care about it until I wanted to go on. But, but you know, the reality is that you know I don't, I didn't do that bad, but I feel like an inferior. Often inferior. Like I laugh. And I'm sure that some of you have felt the same thing. There's uh, the reason that we see drugs as a problem. We see that people chase after uh, uh, intimacy that uh, outside of marriage or chase after alcohol or chase after or money or whatever it might be. It's because they feel like they're, they, they're lacking something, isn't it? These are some of the symptoms. What pressures are you facing? You guys have pressures that you're facing. Trying to pass. Trying to get that good evaluation at work. Trying to impress that girl or that guy. None of you guys have that problem, do you? Here's an actress. I always had that problem. I was like, you know, I wanted that girl to like me. You know, when our Dell came to church the very first Sunday, and, and uh, I, I, you know, it was like a, a vulture in some ways. And it's like, wow, oh, a single girl at our church. But, uh, and, and you know, that she was this cute girl, and I thought, I hope I can, I, can impress, I can impress her. But you know, I must have done something, right? Because if you ask her today, Ardell, what was I wearing that first Sunday you saw me? <laughs> she remembers. I couldn't tell you what she was wearing. How was I wearing, Ardell? Yeah, base rugby pants and a rugby jersey. And it was stylish. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I you know, I, my my whole 
wants to impress this new girl. There's so many different pressures. I, I saw a video the other day when we were at the Bill Graham Evangelical Association, the pastor's conference, and it was this girl on the front, and she was, what I would, no, she was, wasn't really goth, she wasn't, uh, um, she, just, she had dark eye makeup on, what do they call it, emo, or what is that right? Am I going down the right way? Look like she hated herself, right? That kind of you know those people. That was true. They look like they don't, they're miserable. They don't like themselves, right? That's the impression they give you. The, the, so they, but uh, but the reality is, she's in this video and she goes. The first thing she says in it is, "How long? How long are you going to wait to tell me? How long?" And, and at first you're just like, "What is she talking?" About? And then she says, how long do you wait to tell me that God loves me and somebody cares for me? You know, you see me on the street and you avoid me. You don't want to make eye contact with me. How long will you until you tell me that God loves me? There's so many people out there today. Part of the symptoms I see over in our society is there's so many people that feel so unloved. No one cares. We avoid them, we laugh at them, we don't want to make eye contact with them, you know, all those kinds of things. But they, what they're really looking for is to know that someone cares, and someone loves them. So this is, these are the symptoms. What about your parents, though? Do your parents have issues that they're facing, struggles that they're facing? I know my parents are. I know uh, that uh, Lee and Madeline's parents are. I know that uh, I'm sure all of us, our parents are facing struggles. Why do some of our parents, you know, I don't know everybody's situation, but why do some of our parents divorce? Why do some of our parents um, do, do some of these things that, that we see happening in our society today? Why do some of our parents are trying to be so aggressive and, and seem to be so, so angry? Questions that we need to ask. What about our grandparents? My mom just broke her hip a couple weeks ago. And we're glad that she's home and she's helped on the way to the men's, but there's issues there. There's so much more we could talk about. So many different symptoms. But you know that they're out there and they're all around us. Issues that people are facing. So, what then is the disease? What it sounds like to me is the world is full of the little attacking organisms that are eating away at our flesh. That's how it sounds like to me. You know, it sounds like there's so much that's just eating at us and, and, and taking us down and destroying us and, and, and uh, making us feel all these things like this. It's similar to what I thought of was similar to a ship that goes down at sea. When it goes down, it's pretty good, but after a while, it slowly disintegrates. The organisms get at it and eat it and, and it becomes nothing. Dust. Often there's so many of us feel like we're a sinking ship. That we're going down and we just can't get up. There's no nothing to get us back to the surface. And then what we're finding is that, that we're just slowly being eaten away and we're just feeling like we're just we're just we're becoming invisible, evaporating. It's a tough thing. Or maybe it's like what we used to call a disease that we did not understand hundreds of years ago, or even as late as the last century, my grandparents at the time, is that they, we called it consumption. You ever heard of the word consumption? It covered everything that the doctors didn't know what, they, what it was. But it's a good word, isn't it? Consumption. It's things that are just consuming us, and that are destroying us, that are taking us down. Today, we have a terrible disease that nearly, I think, has affected almost every family. We call it, what, cancer. And what we're talking about today is a disease that's consuming people, slowly killing them and destroying them from the inside out. And we see all the effects around us. It's like a cancer that is spreading at an epidemic rate. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it tells us what, the, what is affecting all people. And in that passage of scripture, oops, that's, me up there. <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> I just got through and read there from there before. Just as sin entered the whole world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spreads to all men because all sinned. 
So what is this? We know the symptoms, and here's the diagnosis. Is that we are sinners. All of us are sinners. Nobody here is without sin. We all fall short. We all struggle. We all have, have issues. And the reality is, when you said indigestion, I'm glad you said that this morning, Stephen, because, because I, I remember taking a class one time that said, the reason that there's so much um, physical illness is because of our spiritual illness. Because of what's, what is happening in our lives according to, uh, with sin. Is that we have been, we have all these things going on. And as a result, it causes us to struggle. It causes us a lot of pain. And in a lot of people, that comes through in our physical ailments as well. Why do I have high blood pressure? I started, I had high blood pressure when I was in college, of all things. Started to develop. And I wasn't, as, I wasn't as, as heavy as I am now. Actually, I was, I was able to play racquetball. I did lots of different things, played baseball, so I had a lot of great times, just like any of you guys. But I had high blood pressure, hypertension, they call it, right? I went into the, into the nurse's uh, office because at that, uh, on American College, you don't want to go to the doctor because doctors cost money, so they provide a nurse at the campus. I went in, my blood pressure was 160 over 120. And then I went in another time, it was 165, roughly 160 over, one, over 130. Why? Because of stress. Because of... of of all the different things that we are encountering. Ardell and I actually even went to counseling at that time, had to figure out how to fight properly and how to treat each other decently and things like that. And, and we all have those struggles. We all have times that we, 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 we struggle. We feel alone. We feel, you know, that, that there's, the world is just piling up around us. Why? A lot of has to do with sin. You know, we don't need to wait for the next suit, the big super bug that they often talk about in the hospitals and the doctor. It's because it's affecting us already, I believe. The big super, super bug really, in a sense, is sin. It's destroying our lives, our families, our friends, and individuals on a daily basis. It's ripping us apart at the seams. We see, see it in the face of those walking down the street. We see it in those in the business suits. We see it in those in the torn up clothes of the men and women, or men and women who are living on the street. We see it in the stadiums of the cities. Madeline and I, we went down to uh, the, to the rush game last night, and you can look around in that stadium, or in, that, in the Coliseum, and see people that are hurting. Putting on good faces for the world, but you know that they're struggling. We see it also in the pews of our churches. I'm sure there's some of you here this morning that are not, life is not treating you just perfectly. Things are not easy. But how are you facing it? Sends such people, such a sends a person into such despair that they don't know what uh, what things to do next. They never uh, would have uh, do things that they would maybe never have imagined. Things like drugs or alcohol. <coughs> people who go downtown, who even might even sell their own bodies in order to fix the, the things that they think are wrong. Why living reckless lives and so much more? We see people dread. Dressing like they, like they feel, for example, the one that I mentioned earlier, wearing those who wear only black and uh, or torn up clothes, or, or you know, those that you can't wear long sleeves only because of why. Do you understand why? It's because of what they've done to their arms. I had a girl that in our church in Saskatoon that continually cut herself because that she thought maybe that would make her feel better. Somehow it would make things better. But we know that wasn't the, what the answer is, is it? But I ask you a question. Do you think people want to feel worthless? Do you think people want to feel lonely? Do you think people want to feel like no one loves them or all kinds of other destructive things? I don't think so. I don't believe that's how people really want. I remember going through seven years of my life that I felt like nobody cared. Nobody wanted me around. Nobody wanted to take the time to ask me how I was doing. I thought if I died, not a single person would even show up at my funeral because they wouldn't miss me. I was defeated. And yes, I was a Christian. But I lost sight of what could help me. We can all do that, you know. Maybe 
maybe you're a believer and you're struggling. And you know, it's, it's not uncommon. If this disease that we have has a cure, would, it not, would you not want to get it and give it to those you see who, whose lives are falling apart? Those who want to, to give up and end it all. Would it not be great to tell them that it's going to be okay because we have a cure for what ails you, for what you're struggling with? I wish with all my strength I could have, could have told my cousin to stop. Stop. There's hope. There's an answer. There's a cure for, for, the, for your loneliness and your weakness. There's a cure for what, what you say that when you, when, as you wrote a note out to us that said that I can't live this lie anymore. There's a cure for that. There's something, there's something people that want to help. Stop. I have was look what you're looking for. And there's a way out of what seems hopeless. Stop. I love you and I can help. My generation and our parents took, a, took us to church, at least some of us, you know, some of the time. But there's a generation that's full of people that have never heard the name of Jesus proclaimed except for as a curse word. So they need to hear that Jesus has what nobody else has to offer. He has a cure for what they feel and what they're struggling with. The problem is that Christians, we have a cure, but we want to keep it to ourselves. At least that's what it seems. It's why it always amazes me the hardest thing to get people to come to, and this is not to convict you or to make you feel bad, but the hardest thing really to get people to come to is to come to training so that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ. Action 52, we have coming at the end of next month, one month away, on the 27th of, uh, 26th and 27th. On the 26th, we have an opportunity to share our faith with those that don't believe, as we have a free concert here at the church. And then on the Saturday, we have a time for training. And it's so hard to get people to commit to that. Why? Because sometimes I think we don't really care. We have the cure. We have what the cure that, that can help people that are struggling, that are, that are failing, that are, that are feeling so out of, out of place and out of sorts. I challenge you to make sure <coughs> you take that opportunity to share. <coughs> My cousin went into a trailer and at the end of a rope never knew that there was a cure for what he thought was hopeless. He took his life. There, needs, there is a need to take medicine of the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. You know, you might have a friend <coughs> who's not a believer, who looks as happy as all, you know, they put on a great mask and look like everything's good. My cousin came out to Edmonton. It looked like everything was fantastic. And he was coming around. He wanted to make sure to go see all of our family. Went home to Toronto. And felt like there was no hope. Don't, don't waste that opportunity to share with your friends, those that you love, those your family, that you care about. That there is a hope. There is something better in this world than what, what, the, what the world has to offer. The cure. Earlier we read in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. It says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Here's the cure. Jesus is the cure. He has the answer for what the world is in need of. But how can we keep it to ourselves? Maybe you're a Christian, you're here and you're hurting. Jesus wants to remind you today that he wants to carry the load for you. He wants you not to, to feel like you need to go it alone. He wants to give you rest. I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you who are, have, are burdened, all of you who are struggling, all of you who feel lonely and unwanted. I will give you rest. <coughs> Maybe going through this world and it hasn't hit you yet. <coughs> it seems all fine, but the day will come. You know, I don't understand why. But I want you to know that don't, I don't want you to forget that Jesus is there to give you what you need. <coughs> the 
the cancer that has affected the world, infected the world, is the door where you become easy. Or has it already come in? Jesus in the book of Revelation tells us that he stands at the door and knocks, and we need to come in, he wants to come in and give you that rest. Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you say to him that I want you to help me through this dangerous world? Will you receive him as Savior? Our Savior went to the cross to bring a cure to, this, to, to our life. And then he went to the grave. And then he rose again in order to give us that fresh new hope. Will you receive it today? That's the cure. It's not going by ourselves. It's not trying to make the world. God never intended for us to try to do it all by ourselves. He desires to walk hand in hand with you through all these times. Are you struggling? Are you feeling these things that the world, the symptoms of this world, are Why don't you turn your life to Jesus and let Him?